Welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We've got quite a lot of people here today, so chat's going to go absolutely insane for a little while, which is awesome. Um, we'll give everybody here just about 20 or 30 seconds to make sure everybody's online. Hello, everybody. By the way, chat, as we get started here, and I'm going to address this here in, in a second, um, let's try to keep chat to relevant topics. I will ban everybody, anybody who uh, is abusing chat, and we'll make sure that I'm, we're clear about that. So try to keep it relevant, but definitely go crazy here in the beginning. So all right, let's get started. Welcome athletes, parents, and coaches to another edition of Hashtag FFT Live presented by Fitter and Faster Swim Camps. My name is Tyler Clary, and I'm Director of Sales and Marketing here at Fitter and Faster. I hope you all had a great weekend. Let us know in chat where you're from and which swim team you're repping. If at any time the chat be begins to get a bit overwhelming, you can minimize it by clicking on the red button right over here with three white dots like aligned vertically on the right-hand side of your screen, and that'll minimize the chat for you. If at any point people begin to spam, I will have to remove you from the broadcast, so please do not spam. However, if you have a question at any point, I encourage you to participate in this discussion and we will try to answer your questions at, as they come in. However, if chat begins to get too crazy, I'll shut it down because I don't really want to take anything away from the presentation that we have scheduled today and we'll do Q&A at the end. That being said, let's get started. Welcome to this episode titled Breaking Down Streamline and Underwater Dolphin Kick. We've gotten a lot of requests about this specific topic and I hope you enjoy it. Make sure that while our presenters are speaking that you're writing down notes. That's the best way to remember this stuff five, six, seven weeks from now, aside from coming back to our website and watching the replay. Without further ado, let me, re let me introduce our presenters, Marina Spadoni and Christopher Reed. Marina Spadoni is a social media manager here at Fitter and Faster, and she does a friggin' awesome job. And she's been a clinician with us since 2018. She was an Arizona State Sun Devil where she swam with Coach Bob Bowman, who's Michael Phelps' coach. Y'all know who that is, right? And she was team captain there, and she's from Southern California like me. She's an Olympic trials qualifier in the 50 and 100-meter freestyles as well. We also have Christopher Reed here with us today, who's a South African Olympian who competed in the 100 meter backstroke at the 2016 Rio Olympic Games, where he was a semifinalist and competed on the 4x100 freestyle relay. He attended the University of Alabama, where he was a two time SEC champion, and he holds the South African record in the 100 and 200 backstroke events. And he also won the 100 meter backstroke at the South African trials in 2016. He's an amazing clinician who's been with us since December 2018. Welcome, Marina and Chris. Hey, guys. Excited to be here. Oh, it's good good to have you. Where, uh, Marina, where are you at right now? Uh, I'm in Christiansburg, Virginia. Christiansburg, Virginia. What's what's it like there today? Uh, it's actually great. It's sunny and nice and warm out. Enjoying the weather. Good. How, well, how about you, Chris? Where are you at? I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina, right now. Oh, I didn't realize you were that close, man. I'm down. Yeah. I'm down just south in Charlotte. Yeah, I just moved here in uh, what June, July last year. Gotcha. How are you liking Raleigh, the Triangle, so to speak? Yeah, I'm loving it. It's such a cool place. It's nice being yeah. in a city instead of a small town. <laughs> for sure. For sure. Well, um, so tell us, you know, tell us a little bit about, you know, your your journey so far as uh, as clinicians with Fitter and Faster. I guess, Marina, Marina, we'll start with you. Um, yeah, so I graduated from Arizona State in 2016, and I decided to retire from swimming and pursue a career. I was a high school English teacher. I taught English as a second language and high school literature. And um, after about a year of doing that, I decided it wasn't quite for me. I looked, I started coaching again and reached out to Chloe Sutton. I was like, hey, like, can I get involved with Fitter and Faster? I really want to be back in the swimming community. Um, I started at Fitter and Faster as an event manager. So I would just travel with the uh, other clinicians and kind of like run the show from behind the scenes. And then Fitter and Faster kind of got rid of that position. And uh, Chloe was like, hey, what do you think about getting back in the water and just kind of like 
doing some drills for us and kind of being like the second clinician. I was like, well, okay, I haven't been in the water for two years, but I'll try it. And so really fitter and faster was my way back into the sport. Um, I hadn't been in the water for two years. I totally didn't swim at all during those two years while I was teaching. Um, so yeah, I got in, I remembered how much I loved it. Um, and then I kind of dropped everything and started swimming again. I moved out here to Virginia uh, last September and I started training with Sergio Lopez out here. So it's been great. I've been having a great time, having a lot of success, a lot more success than when I was in college. So it's awesome. That's awesome. I'm glad to hear that. And we're, we're obviously very, very happy to have you. Chris, what about you? Tell us how you kind of came to be introduced to Fitter and Faster. Yeah, it was, um, it was actually through, uh, you know, I just graduated. I was really looking to get into coaching and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Brett Hawk reached out to me and was like, hey, do you ever be interested in um, coaching, which I thought was kind of funny because I'm in Alabama, but hey, I love Brett. And um, yeah, did a clinic with him, really enjoyed it. And, um, you know, as I've been pursuing my professional career in swimming, I always want to coach kids and, you know, coaching full time is a little more strenuous on me just as I'm an athlete and, you know, standing up two to three, four hours a day is a lot of me. So um, getting out every weekend and doing these clinic really fits my schedule. And I love just sharing what I know and what I've gathered through the years. Um, so, yeah, it's been a good year and a half. No, good. We're so, so happy to have you as well. And, uh, you know, I get all of the, I get all of the emails, um, you know, when we get reviews and, and your, your reviews are awesome, man. So, uh, really happy to have you. And if you, if you guys think back to when you were 12 or 13, you know, it's, it's cool to be a part of this company and this brand because, you know, when we were young, stuff like this didn't exist, you know, and, you were really lucky to get introduced not only to somebody, you know, in your state who was good and be able to learn from them, but, you know, to be able to get some of the best clinicians in the nation, if not the world. I mean, you're, you're here from South Africa and, and you bring a lot of, uh, you know, unique perspective with you. It's really cool what we get to do and what we be a part of. So Chad, it's, we're, we're stoked that you guys are here and, um, you know, we're honored that we get to do this at the same time. So, um, so I guess to, to get right into it, Talk to us a little bit about the importance of Streamline and the importance of underwater dolphin kicking and swimming today, and maybe compare and contrast a little bit the differences in, in short course and long course swimming and the, and the need for underwaters and dolphin kicking there. Uh, yeah, so I started thinking about underwaters as a crucial part of the swimming uh, in about 2008. I actually very specifically remember watching Ryan Lochte in the Olympics and like just being blown away by how incredible his underwaters were and how much they changed his racing style. And, you know, they just put him on a different level than everyone else. And I kind of made a decision in 2008 that I was like, all right, I'm going to be the best underwater kicker that I can possibly be. Uh, so I was about, I was in eighth grade when I saw that. So this has been a very, very long journey for me um, to get where I am today um, with my underwater kicks. Um, and it started little by little, but um, I really do think that it's has changed the sport um, just from 10, 15 years ago to where we are now. You look at people like Caleb Dressel and Kelsey Worrell, and they just dominate the field of short course um, just, just because of their underwaters, let alone. Uh, they're great swimmers, but yeah, I really think that underwaters, if you can really nail it, are the key to unlocking really going from a great swimmer to a really truly amazing swimmer. Totally agree. What about you, Chris? Yeah, I mean, I think if anyone's ever watched my race races, um, I've always right, probably can see that I'm probably the fastest swimmer in the pool. That I'm at the time the worst. <laughs> Um, at my starts and my, my turns and my, my underwater kicking. Um, <laughs> fortunately, when I came to college in the United States, um, we're swimming in short course yards. So I have less pool to swim in and more time to turn and kick underwater. Um, so that was really tough for me because, you know, up until then I'd been swimming long course meters my whole time, my whole life. There wasn't really a need uh, to kick underwater. Um, so 
these past five years has been a big learning curve for me, even in practices, um, pushing these new boundaries um, and learning new things about my swimming because, you know, I have been, I've improved about two seconds in the past year and a half in my turn wow. back stroke, and I can pretty much credit all of that just to underwater kicking and better streamlines and um, being more efficient in the water underwater. Um, so I'm still learning. I'm by no means um, on the top tier of underwater kickers, but I'm getting pretty close nowadays. So, well, and, and you know that's such a um, that's such a powerful thing that you just said because as you you know it's very clear that you're one of the best swimmers in the world. Like if you if you think about how many swimmers that are out there, like you're up very near the tip top, right? And as you get closer and closer to that um, that upper, you know. Tenth of a percent, really. It's really difficult to drop time, and to be able to drop about two seconds, and attribute that all to your underwaters. That shows that no matter how good you are, like you should really be working on that. And there was a statistic that um, was read to me several years ago. That um, it was it was a a statistical study that had been done on all of the past um, Olympic swims for the past like two decades or something like that. And they showed that the person who was first to the 15 meter mark had a statistical advantage. They were more likely to win the race just by being first to the 15 meter mark. And that doesn't necessarily mean it has to be underwaters, but we know that if you're really good underwater, you can carry more speed underwater than you can on the top of the water, especially to 15 meters. So that's, that's a really powerful thing. So I guess let's just get right into it. Um, Marina, do you want me to pull up that um, that presentation that you got for us? Yeah, let's do it. Let's jump in. All right, yeah, so our topic is Streamlines and Underwaters and we made a little PowerPoint kind of presentation to keep us on track and kind of keep conversation flowing so that we can give you guys the best uh, information possible but let's get into it. So I just wanted to start out with like some objectives for us. Uh, I think it just helps for you guys to have like what we're gonna talk about today. Um, it's very teacher of me to do this, but I felt that my students learned best when I had objectives for them. So our topic is Streamlines Underwaters. Um, we're hoping that you guys um, get an understanding for the frequency and amplitude and how that applies to your underwaters. And we'll go more into depth in that for that. Um, and then at the end, we're going to show you how to apply this to your underwaters and streamlines through drills and mobility so that you can um, hopefully practice at home and get a little better even while we're out of the water right now. Uh, we have some stuff that you guys can work on. So yeah. Um, do you want to talk about streamlines, Chris? I feel like that'd be great. Yeah. I mean, uh, whenever we're at clinics, I always get the kids to kind of walk in a streamline and get really tight and squeeze their ears and put our ankles on our knees together and kind of walk around on the tiptoes. And, you know, what I try to do by doing that is to really show how hard it actually is to be as tight as possible in the water. You know, um, I always say to people, if you cannot do it on land, you're definitely not going to be able to do it in the water. So if you can't, keep your feet together or at least just have your toe points when you're out of the water, you're not going to do it inside of the water. Um, so mm -hmm. I think with the streamlines, honestly, for me, it's the biggest um, improvement. My, my starts, for instance, like we, we have this very nice graphic of the start here. And before coming to college, everyone would see me. I'd have this really big, nice arch my backstroke start but my hands for instance i'd be pointing or oh, i'd be pointing backwards <laughs> and um my yeah. hands because i've broken that let me move backwards a little bit because i've moved you know my hands are pointing backwards i'm going to go all the way down to the floor and i'm not going to have that straight line so i was always kind right. of famous for going down to the bottom of the pool then kicking my way up and reaching out of the water uh. like a whale. Um, so, you know, as we can see with that graphic there too, people underestimate just how much of a, a 
a straight line you actually need to be in. Um, you know, even just if your toes are bent and locked as if you're standing up, that's going to slow you down a lot. So, so with your head, I see a lot of people when they're diving, they're diving with their head up or even in the streamlines. And um, I always kind of say to people, kind of look at a, a torpedo, right? We want to have that, that swoosh through the water um, where there's nothing, any, there's nothing really slowing it down. It's just complete, just the water's just carrying you and you're gliding off as far as you can. Um, right. Yeah, yeah I mean, definitely. I feel like uh, people underestimate how much of like an active position streamline is. Uh, I ha at my camps, I see a lot of people like go on streamline, but it's very relaxed and it's just like kind of a very like casual position. But I don't know if you can attest to this, but when I'm in streamline, I feel like I'm engaging all my muscles. Like my biceps and triceps are totally locked in. And even like my core and my quads, I'm pulling my quads up. So I'm totally engaged in my quads. And like you said, pointing the toes. So um, I like to like tell the people that I teach just like, if you're going to start a running race, you're not going to just kind of be standing there like, all right, let's go you're going to be like kind of ready, like in this, like ready to go position um, to start this race. And I feel like the streamline is the same thing off every wall. You want to be in that uh, activated position so you can just launch into that underwater kick. But yeah, so I think yeah. it's so important. I also, I, I, I think someone who's always focused more on swimming, I always try to rest and rest yeah. on Turns. So, like, as you're saying, having those lazy turns, I kind of push off, be all broken, you know, yeah. elbows away from the ears, just kind of sloppy. And um, it, it, yeah, I might be resting, um, but I'm not gaining anything in my race. You know, it's actually right. going to probably make me more tired at the end of the race because once I come out swimming, coming out behind someone who had a good streamline, yeah. and I have to work even harder to catch up to them instead of beating yeah. them. Yeah, it's funny because, like, I feel like we're exact opposites. I was not really a very strong swimmer, but I had very strong legs, and I knew that streamline and underwater was just something that didn't take a lot of talent. It just took, like, mental effort. So I was like, well, okay, I might not be beating them in a swim, but I can definitely get them on this underwater um, or this streamline just by having, like, a little bit of a better streamline. I'd make up a lot in a 200 and, you know, get pretty close in races like that. So uh, it's funny. There's a little different perspective there, but yeah, for sure. I think it's too, it's like, it's a very small thing that, I mean, when we're going to practices, we're doing what, 200, 300, sometimes 400 turns. Yeah. Uh, especially if you're short course yards and, you know, that's a real small thing that, you know, I was talking to someone last night about when you're practicing, right, you are, when you go and race, you are exactly what you've been practicing. You're not going right. to suddenly raise up and rise up to the, the challenge, um, yeah. right? You're, just, you're a result of what you practice. And, yeah. um, you know, I always say to people, okay, you want to get better at your underwater kicking or you want to get better at your streamlines, okay? Let's say today we're going to practice, we have 200 turns. And you're thinking every single time you go into turn, okay, tight streamline, let's get three kicks. If you try that for every single turn during the day, um, well, that session, maybe you only hit 40, or you remember to do 40 of the, the 200 turns. Um, that's a standard, that's a starting point, and you right. can always get closer to that goal, right? Um, you know, I mean, even now as a professional athlete, if I'm doing, I'm probably hitting about 95% of my turns perfectly. So sometimes right. I'll completely just space out. But um, as you're saying, being active, I'm always thinking, I'm always wanting to um, improve. I'm always looking at how to improve. And it's an active thought throughout my swimming, right? Yeah. And I think that's like something so important for everyone listening to remember like it's 
not really that much of a physical effort to have really good streamlines. It's more of a mental effort. And I think that's kind of what makes the division between like a good summer and like going to the next level of being a great summer is like actually making the effort to, like you said, think about 90% of your turns, 95% of your turns as being amazing turns. And, you know, like I, I myself, my wine, my mind wanders quite a bit sometimes when I swim and it's really hard to like snap back into that. Like, Oh, right. Okay. I'm trying to do A, B and C in my swimming right now. So um, I think just knowing that you don't have to be incredibly talented to do these things. It really is just like turning on the mental effort. Um, so it's definitely something everyone here can do for sure. But yeah. Um, and like what I wanted to add was, I think streamlines are the building block to everything we do in this sport. Like without a good streamline, there's going to be no amazing breaststroke. There's going to be no great backstroke. There's going to be no great freestyle. So if you can really like learn to, get that great streamline, then everything else will be that much easier. So I think a lot of people try to jump into the dolphin kicks or try to jump like, oh, I'm gonna be an amazing underwater kicker, but then their streamline is mediocre and it just really doesn't mean anything if the streamline isn't there. So I think above anything, I'd rather see all my swimmers have amazing streamlines um, before anything else. Yeah. And let's really talk about, you know, maybe maybe you guys can think of, um, you know, a cue that you give yourself to really work on this a practice, because I just showed a poll chat. You guys just answered that poll. Thank you for that. And I asked them, do you have great streamlines off of every wall at practice? And, and 70 percent of people said no. So, wow. like, what are some things that people can can give themselves to, you know, really think about that off of every wall? You know, what, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, well, you know, um, one of my friends um, has told me about the game. He used to play Tala, and, um, you know, I, I used to do it too when I was at Alabama, where we would actually, in a way, make streamlines really fun. We would make a game out of it. Uh, for instance, we would push off or have a dive into the water and see just how far we can glide. Yeah. And the very first time I did it, coming off the boat from South Africa, um, I went about eight meters and I came to a complete stop. <laughs> um, but over my four years, I can get up to, I think it's 18 meters now, um, which is not bad. Um, but I didn't go automatically from eight to 18, just like that in over a year. Um, you know, it is, after practice, there would be a few of us after practice would say, I'd challenge some people. I'd be like, hey, Tyler, I bet you can't beat me today. And go in, push off, and see. And, you know, we would mess around. Okay, why don't you try and squeeze your toes together or try maybe crush a, um, a walnut between um, your legs or maybe you need to put your head up or down. And um, kind of with my teammates or my coaches, just kind of in a way see have works. Fun. Yeah, and yeah. see what works. Experiment. As exactly. as as I say to people all the time, you know, we when we get to a race, we're always scared that we're gonna have a bad race. We're scared we're gonna fail. But in practice, that's the best place in the whole world to fail. Because mm, you can totally. practice failing again and again and again. So eventually you don't fail, then you start realizing, okay, well, this is what I don't have to do anymore. You know, so a lot setting yourself up to really fail and practice allows you to succeed if that makes sense no it makes complete sense you're learning what not to do in a race right and cool. and by experimenting you're getting all of that information that you can sort of digest later on you figure out all right this works or this doesn't work and you know we had a name for that for that game it was called glide off and ryan lochte and i would would play this almost every single day and and actually chat this is what i challenge you guys to do when you know we get back into the pool and pools are open, um, I want you to find someone that's about the same skill level, and I want you to before practice, I want you to jump in and practice three uh, three rounds of the glide off game, where you guys just both push off at the same time and see who can glide farther without kicking. Just that little bit of competition at the beginning of practice really, really helps. 
And if you start thinking about that more and more, it's going to be more likely that during practice, you're going to be aware enough to make sure that you're doing it during practice. And the beauty about it is, is that if you do it, if you just really think about it for just six weeks, I promise you it'll become like autopilot. I guarantee if I was to add, actually, I'll ask this question to you guys right now. Marina and Chris, you've done this so much now. How much thinking do you actually have to do now to do a perfect streamline? And I'm gonna, willing to bet that the answer is going to be relatively uh, relatively low amounts of thinking about it because it's become autopilot because you've done it so many times. Am I right or wrong? Yeah, totally. It's definitely oh, yeah. just automatically get into that position. So I know don't... when it's not a good streamline, I can definitely <laughs> feel it. And I'm like, oh, that wasn't good. That no. was bad. <laughs> but the idea is, is like, you know, everybody talks about muscle memory and I talk about muscle memory a lot. And muscle memory has absolutely nothing to do with your muscles and everything to do with your brain. And what we're doing every day when we practice is that we're programming our bodies to do a certain thing, right? We're programming our bodies to have a certain performance at the end of the season. And if you go through practice and you have bad streamlines off the wall, that's the programming that you're giving yourself. And that will just feed back in on itself. But if you just spend six weeks when we get back in the water of really forcing yourself to have good streamline off the wall, it will pay dividends down the road and it will become autopilot. That will become your new normal. And one thing to keep in mind, folks, is that literally the easiest way to get faster in swimming is to work on your streamline. There's literally no other way to get faster in stream in, in your in your swimming than it is to work on streamline. You don't have to work any harder. All you have to do is pay attention to what your body's doing in the water. The fastest point in any lap of any race that you'll ever swim, other than the start, of course, is the instant in which you push off the wall. The best swimmers in the world, like Maria and like Christopher right here, are the best in the world because they've learned how to slow down the least. They've learned how to ed take advantage of that huge speed spike that they have off the wall by really nailing that streamline. So sorry to hijack it. I just thought that was a, a great point. <laughs> that was awesome. That was awesome. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, you go. No, go ahead. I had nothing to say. Uh, I mean, I think to add to Tyler's point, and this is something I do, Chad, um, in my day, you know, as a high-level athlete, I come into practice every single day and I say, okay, today I'm going to be a master of one, this one thing, you know, um, you know, cause someone once said to me, someone that's made someone like Matt Reeve is so successful is okay. Yes. He's a complete giant weighs what six, seven, six, eight. Um, but he is probably the master of all details in his backstory. He's, he's backstory. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And, um, I, every single day I'll come in and I'll challenge myself. Okay. Even if I'm swimming extremely slow, my coaches can test to how slow I can swim. Sometimes <laughs> I'm going to make sure I have the best three months today, or I'm going to make sure that every single turn I have today, I'm going to do at least five dolphin kicks. Yeah. And even if I swam extremely slow the whole day, but I did at least I, or I, every single turn I did five dolphin kicks. I take away that day as a win. Um, right. I've, I've achieved something, although it's just one day out of the rest of the year. What if I come back tomorrow and try focus on the same thing and kind of building that muscle memory or these good habits um, and mastering those details? Because eventually, as as you and I can both experience, right? I pretty much have a good term all the time, a turn or streamline or kick all the time, but I've, I only recognize when I don't. Because I'm yeah. so used to doing perfect or close to perfect. If that makes sense. Yeah. No, exactly. And I think you said that you have made a streamlines a game and things like that. And like one way that I have, you know, made it fun, I guess, to work on streamlines for me was when I was growing up in high school, we had this coach that said three line streamline off every wall. And at first that was a chore, like three lines. Oh my gosh, like why? And then it kind of has come up to the point where like everyone has their weak stroke, everyone has their weakness. And my huge weakness is pulling. I hate pulling. 
I would never want to pull. I can kick faster than I can pull. It's just a nightmare. I hate every pull set, but um, I'm like, okay, well, I know for a fact that I can do three lines off of every wall streamline with a pull buoy. And like that, ha like that will be like, okay, that's like three lines less that I have to pull if I can do a perfect streamline off that wall. So everyone has that stroke that they hate, like maybe you hate breaststroke. You're like, okay, well, if I stay in streamline, a perfect streamline, I can go pretty far without actually having to swim breaststroke. Um, it's kind of like a little like hack of the system, but it does get you great streamlines. So, you know, um, that's one way that I practice my streamlines a lot actually. Um, but yeah, for sure. Um, should we move on? Yeah, perfect. Um, underwater kicks. So awesome. It moved. Um, so there's two parts of an underwater kick. And I asked this at all my clinics. I'm like, Oh, what part of the kick is the strongest, the up kick or the down kick? You know, it's usually a split crowd. Some people are like, Oh, up kick, some people down kick. And I feel like both of us know that the right answer is both should be equally as powerful. Um, and so the up kick, you can see from the graphic down here is using your lower back, hamstrings and glutes. And then the down kick, you're kind of activating your abs, hip flexors and quads. Um, so it's really great to like, if you know, like you're like, oh, I really have a weak down kick. You can be like, well, maybe that I need to strengthen my ab, work on some ab exercises or strengthen my quads and things like that. Same with the up kick, um, but both should be equally as powerful. And um, we have some drills for you guys at the end that you can test out your um, up kick and down kick power when you're back in the pool in six, eight weeks. But yeah, there's not a lot more than just, this is more information for you guys to know um, what parts of the kick there is. So the up kick and the down kick. Look at that. Yeah. yeah. I, um. You know, I don't know about for you, since you've always been such a gifted underwater kicker. Uh, I, you know, if you ever watched me, I'd always have a big kick and then a yeah. very slow and then a big kick. So I was always like kind of just going down with my kick as well. Um, and for me, people would be like, oh, well, you know, this is a problem I faced and still face today. Um, you know, they, they'll say, well, you're not kicking down enough or big enough. and um, you know, I never really knew because I I'm very much a physical learner. I need to see it done. I need to feel it first before I can start, um, you know, visual and whatnot. And kind of analogy I came up with one day was in chat, if you're in a room and you can stand up, I'd love for you guys to try this. Is I'd stand up, you know, with my legs staggered, one, one foot in front of the other, and I'd imagine as if, I just stepped in mud with my shoe, and now I'm trying to wipe my foot in the grass or grass to get the mud off my foot. And that kind of helped my brain think, okay, well, I'm all the way out of, or how do I explain? I'm all the way out of here. I can learn how to draw my kick and carry it through all the way um, and finish my kick. And I, what I do is I, I kind of stand there at the wall in the, the shallow end, I'd feel that analogy, get the get the size of my kick, mm -hmm. learn how to follow it through, then I'd go through and try kick and try get that same feeling because I'm so, um, I guess I need to be physical and actually have to go through the range of motion from my brain and my body to understand what I'm doing, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. I am a very, like, metaphorical person i like to make a lot of metaphors when i teach and like connecting different things that are outside the pool so i usually say like oh pretend the bottom of the pool is a trampoline and like have you ever jumped on a trampoline okay so if you are laying on a trampoline and then you kick your feet down on the trampoline as hard as possible what's going to happen they're just going to bounce right back up so i try to think of it as like more of a a reaction to my first action. So my first action is that down kick and then the reaction is just springing back up with the mm. feet. Um, that's helped me a lot. It helps me kind of explain the motions quite a bit, but um, yeah, I definitely like metaphors when I'm teaching. 
a trampoline oh. floor and just kind of bouncing right back off of it. Um, but that works a lot for me to get that equal kind of power for the down and up kick. Yeah, I like yeah. that. Um, you know, while you, I've never heard of that trampoline. I really like that idea. I mean, I know, I don't know if you want to do it now, but you have that video of you kicking. I think while that mm. trampoline idea is really fresh in all our heads, do you want to play that so people can actually see? Because when I watch that video, I very much see the trampoline, the bounce, bounce, bounce. Right. If maybe we can check it out. Yeah, so this is my underwater. Um, and we'll get into more of the details of how I swim my underwaters. But yeah, just like you're saying, I definitely have that spring on the kick. And that's yeah, me. Uh, since I'm on my back, I'm thinking of the trampoline as a surface and I'm kicking the trampoline and it's whipping up. Um, so yeah. Yeah, your feet are just bouncing up and down as if you had two trampolines, one on the top and one on the bottom. That's right. really cool. Yeah. So if that helps you or any of the people in the chat, um, think about how you should be, um, executing the up and down kick. I think that that's helped me a lot for sure. Definitely. Um, where did it, oh, there we go. So, all right. So I think going from that video to here is perfect. Um, I like to talk about underwater kicks kind of like physics, which is funny because I almost failed high school physics. I hated physics in high school. But now, like, when I go back to teach uh, swimming, it actually comes in handy a lot. So this is um, a sign graph. And you have amplitude on one line and time on the other. Amplitude would be the size of our kick or the wave motion. And then the frequency is, you know, how many of the crests or troughs that we can get in one, you know, sine wave. So your amplitude cannot go outside of your body frame because once it goes outside of your body frame, you're just creating drag. So because I have a very small, I'm five, 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 six on a good day. Um, as you saw in the video, I have a really small kick and it's pretty fast. Um, but for people who are much taller than me, I see much bigger kicks, slower, more powerful kicks. Um, and that's just because their body frame allows them to uh, create a kick that size. So if, can we go back to that video, Tyler? Can I go? Oh, yeah. Okay, so uh, just so while we're watching it, um, I have a very small amplitude, so I keep the kicks pretty small and a high frequency to go right along with it. Um, and that allows, that is the perfect combination for me to create the most power and speed with my kick. Um, other swimmers who are taller than me have bigger, bigger kick, bigger amplitude, and they generate more power. I just don't have the size to be able to um, slow down my kick enough to make it to make me go fast. Um, and this has just taken a lot of experimentation with me and my coaches. Like, OK, we would put a tempo trainer in my cap and you're like, OK, you're going to kick at this tempo. and We're going to take the time to 15. All right. We're going to try and go up a little bit. We're going to go a couple notches up on the tempo trainer. Now you're going to kick this fast to 15 and see what the time is. Okay, that was slower. Let's go down a couple. Um, so I think that's kind of an unusual use for tempo trainers. I haven't heard a lot of people use tempo trainers for um, timing their kicks. But once you get back in the water, it's a really interesting tool, um, especially if you're number based. Uh, I really am quite a number based swimmer. And I know my nut kick for every wall and it, I, it'll always be the same. Um, and it'll be the same frequency and same amplitude every time I push off the wall. So if you're a very number based swimmer and you like to know the math, I suggest trying a tempo trainer and just messing with that frequency and trying to find what is the best one for you and where you're pulling or where you're catching the most water. But yeah, have um, you messed around with it a bit? Not as a tempo trainer because um, unlike you, I'm not that small i'm six six and a half right 225 pounds um you know i, I was just counting your kicks on that video and um i think it took you 15 kicks to get to 15 yards yeah um, 
you know, an 18 for your feet to get past. For me, it takes me um, off a start, takes me seven kicks, seven wow. big kicks to get to the um, to the 15. So, you know, and then even if I'm doing a turn of backstroke, I take five big kicks and that takes me to 12, yard, 12 meters. Right. Um, so here we have two different kicks where you're really working on small, fast tamper and you have the ability, but, you know, although I wish I could kick like that, I just physically can't. So I'm just, you know, it's yeah. a lot of body to move a lot of water in a given period of time. Um, so for me, what I really focus on, because you're focusing on bouncing your food. Um, it's kind of a loud video. <laughs> Sorry about the loud volume. I just figured it was there. There, the dolphins are compared to like your dolphin kick. What he's getting at is like really, really, really. It's like a, it's like a tuna fish freaking out, like really yeah. fast, right? But those dolphins are like they're much, much bigger, and and they're kind of going outside of your frame. Mm -hmm. And um, I kind of think that's that's the way Chris and really me, um, you know, like Arkady Vyachinin, um, Ryan Lochte. Um, Tiago Pereira all have those really big dolphin kicks yeah. and it's, you know, there's, there's two different ways to skin that cat and for everybody, it's a little bit different. And the idea is, is really, it's kind of the same message as the very beginning of the video that we were talking about is, um, you know, figure out what works for you. You know, if somebody has really short legs, it's probably not going to make sense for them to have a gigantic dolphin kick. But if somebody has really long legs, then maybe they can get away with with a bit with a bigger dolphin kick. Um, do you guys have a couple of drills that you guys do to work specifically on like the efficiency of your dolphin kick, or do you have any tools that you use to that that someone in chat might be able to use when pools ba uh, open back up to use to improve their dolphin kick? Um, for efficiency purposes, I like to do distance per kick. It's exactly the same as distance per stroke, but you're just kind of um, trying to get the least amount of kicks as possible. And that's, it's going to be a huge dolphin kick. And you're really just trying to feel the power from the up and the down kick and generate as much power as possible. So I think my record is three kicks for 25. Um, wow. <laughs> yeah. I, my record's like seven. <laughs> That's impressive. I oh, want to see a video like, of that. I know. I should video it. Next time when I'm in the pool, I'll get a GoPro All specifically right. for this. Um, but, yeah, and you're just really trying to, first, A, the streamline has to be perfect. And ev after every kick, you're resetting into that streamline position and moving forward a little bit. And then you're generating all that power again and then snapping into that streamline position again. Um, that has helped me a lot to just, feel what the kick feels like and like kind of um, understand how the mechanics of my body work. And it's just very over-exaggerated um, kicking. Um, I actually might, um, if anyone on the chat has Instagram, I actually have a pretty good video of me doing that on my Instagram. How do you spell um, your Instagram handle? I'll put it in chat right now. It's -E -A -L -A -L -A -N -I. Yes. Yeah, so it's me with fins on, but it's definitely that huge over-exaggerated kick. Um, and it's a couple posts back, but um, you can see how big I get with the kick and how much water I'm moving with just each kick. Um, so that's a really great one, distance per kick. And it's a fun measure because, like, when I started, I started – in 2018 doing that drill. I think my record was seven as well. And then every time, like, okay, well, seven's my point now. The next time was six. A Couple times later, I could get down to five, just making like little tweaks and like really feeling how it felt um, in the water. And so, yeah, it's, it's a fun drill and it's a good um, benchmark to have for sure. Chris, do you have any, any drills that you work on specifically to help your underwaters or is it just like, try to get a certain number of kicks in off every wall during practice. What do you do? I mean, there's, there's two aspects to it. Um, uh, 
you know, when I, I first needed to learn how to stay underwater, um, you know, there's this funny story. My very first dual meet ever um, was I came, it was like a week after being in America. I did a 200 yard backstroke uh, in Alabama. And um, I never swam or raced short course yards ever. Dove into the pool, did 10 kicks off the start, really going fast, right? And um, next, my turn, I did eight. And then the next turn was six. I know where this is going already. Me yeah. too. <laughs> um, I, I went out really fast as well because I had no idea how to pace. And I was at like 49, two. And uh, <laughs> my, la- my second last turn was I did one kick. And then the very mm-hmm. last turn, um, I already just hit the wall up. and I just popped out like a whale, just like, <laughs> and, um, I ended up going like a 145 in a dual meet. But um, the worst That's thing was, still fast. I heard my whole team just like, ooh. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they could see the grandfather piano get dropped on you from, a, from the other side of the pool. Yeah, I've been there. <laughs> yeah. So with that, I, l- I had to learn how to hold my breath underwater because I think for a lot of people, where they do have the ability to kick, but they just don't know how to stay under. So yeah. for me, I would have to do long backstroke sets where I would just, you know, I wouldn't push my swimming as much, but I would try and kick off the wall 15 meters. Or, I mean, I built up there. So as I said, I'd maybe come in and let's say I was doing a 1,500-yard backstroke set. I would try off every single water, have three kicks. So eventually where I think uh, in 2016, I got up to, I was doing like a 3,000 yard backstroke set long course where I was kicking halfway off every turn, just learning how to stay underwater. I don't recommend that to anyone because that was really hard. <laughs> um, but that helped me Do you me use a nose there. clip? No nose clip. Yeah. Uh, I'm a huge believer in the nose clip. Oh I my use God. It for everything. So I. I love it. Yeah. Oh, I don't use it for everything, but this chat, this is uh, something that I get, I ask questions about a lot. And, and obviously you see that there are three different answers here um, are, you know, how do you keep water from going up your nose? Chris, are you one of those weirdos that can flip your, your lip up over your nose to keep the water from going in? Or how do you handle that? I try to, I try to do what Ryan does, but he's just like, <laughs> <laughs> you try Chris and just, cover your nose up <laughs> yeah i can't do it some people can some people can flip their lip up over here like they're an alien of some kind and they can keep the water from going out or from going up their nose um for what i did for a while until i heard that you can actually lose your sense of smell was i would just deal with the water going back in, into my nose I, I would just deal with it and that's really unpleasant i don't suggest it for everybody but what i started doing was i took one of those metal nose clips and started using it in practice. Now, if you're going to grab one of those, don't go and just grab one and go swim in a meet. Train with the sucker first because yeah. it is it is a different experience. Like you have to get used to it. But I think it's so huge. And I think backstrokers all over the place really, really learn how to train with one and how to race with one because not only does it make it easier to keep the water from going up your nose, but let's think about this from a physical perspective. This is a shout out to Marina here. Water, water in water doesn't do anything. But if you have air underneath water, it wants to rise up to the surface. So if you're going to push off the wall in a good streamline and go down, and then you want to eventually come back up, if you're getting rid of your air, it's going to make it difficult to get back up to the surface. Whereas if you're keeping the air in your body, whether if you're on your stomach or if you're on your back and you have a nose clip on, it's going to be that much easier to ride the buoyancy in your chest to get back up to the surface. So something that's really, really huge. Marina, you use your nose clip for everything? Yeah. I get made fun of it for it a lot. Uh, a lot of my teammates are like, well, loser. Uh, <laughs> but I don't know. I started it works for you. It because I was a backstroker in high school. I sent the 200 back. I was recruited for the 200 backstroke. And, um, you know, I kind of got used to it. And then I started doing sprint freestyle and I couldn't hold my breath underwater like uh, Chris was saying. So I was like, oh, maybe I'll just try it. I'll just try swimming, sprinting and amazing. Uh, so I'm one of the few, few sprint freestylers that 
So, so I thought that was cool. Hey, but again, that works. just proves it. That, that's, but that's exactly the point. If it works for you, it works for you. That's all that matters. So, all right, chat, I'm gonna open up, uh, I'm gonna enable chat again. And it's about to go nuts, so watch everybody. Uh, but I would like everybody to think about any final questions that you might have for uh, Marina, Christopher, myself. We'll try to answer a couple of those before we finish up. So um, any good questions about Streamline? Uh, there's, here's one. How many underwater kicks do you do off of every wall in your signature event? So for me in my 200 backstroke, I did nine kicks off the start, and then I would go like eight, seven, eight. For, for long course, for example, so I would go nine off the start, eight off the first turn, seven off the second turn, and eight off of the last turn. That's how I did it. Marina, what about you? Um, I'm 11 off the start to get to 15, and then after that is 12, 12, 12. And the wow. same for 50 free, it's 11, 12. Wow. Okay. What about wow. you, Chris? For me in the turner back, I'm doing uh, seven off the start, and then I'm doing five off every wall. The goal is to get up to eight, like you as well. But I'm yeah. still training. I'm trying to train to get to eight kicks. I think uh, one thing that like we didn't talk about was ankle flexibility. And I, a lot of people, um, there was this like study that came out a couple of years ago that directly correlated ankle flexibility with uh, how good of a kicker you were. And it was before that, it was thought that it was like, okay, well, vertical jump and how much you can squat and like, you know, quad strength was what correlated to how good of a kicker you were. But it actually was proven that uh, ankle flexibility is more of a measure of how um, good of a kicker you are. So if you have super flexible ankles, uh, you're actually able to push the water backwards. So in the video that was on here, and it's on YouTube as well. You can like slow it down. You can see that my ankles are actually moving the water backwards instead of going up and down. Um, so one thing that you guys can do just to get better at underwaters at home is like stretch your ankles, like sit on the couch, um, sit with your toes on the floor and just stretch your ankles. I know I do it all the time. Um, yeah, Tyler's got some real crazy flexible ankles right there. Um, yeah, so just stretch your ankles, sit on your feet, the tops of your feet, uh, have someone else stretch your ankles for you. Uh, it's really great. It's easy to do while you're watching TV, eating dinner, doing nothing. All right, yeah. Alan Zhu, I'm about to ban you if you keep posting that question, all right? <laughs> do it again and I will ban you. Um, I, uh, I particularly use the metal type of nose clip that you can get from Speedo. Um, Same. Chris, okay, so Marina, you do the same thing, and uh, Chris does not use one. Um, here's here's one directly for you, Chris, from uh, Coleman Kimmel. How was swimming against Ryan Murphy in Des Moines? Um, it was really fun. I mean, uh, Ryan and I raced a few times. Uh, he was in a different place in the season. I think he was a little rested, and I was, uh, um, I was at the the end of my hard training just before my Olympic trials, but um, it's always fun because I learned a lot of things about how Ryan's swimming and, um, you know, how I can improve. Like, for instance, he beat me very much on the start. He gained, I think, two meters on the start, and then I never caught up that two meters. So I need to work on my start and my streamline. Hmm. Good. Um how floppy do you, some of these questions are ridiculous. How, how many dolphins should we do for each different distance event? So in distance swimming, when, so when we say distance swimming, we mean like 400 and above up, right? Would you guys agree? Mm -hmm. And most of the time, like in a 400, you might get someone who does like four or five dolphin kicks off the wall at a max. Right. Um, and in a, in the mile, maybe one or two. Like some of those guys, like Sun Yang, for example, comes right up to the surface. Um, whereas a lot of times as the distances go down, in some cases, like in 100 versus 200, you might have maybe a little bit less dolphin kicking. You might be a little bit less likely to go to 15 meters in uh, the 200 versus the 100, where you're more likely to go to 15 meters off of every single wall. Would you guys agree or disagree? I would agree. Um, but... I also don't think, 
I mean, I grew up on a distance team. I grew up training with Chloe Sutton and she still has great underwaters and streamlines as well. Um, and she swam marathon swimming, uh, which is open water swimming 10 K. And then she also swam 400 in the pool. So she has great underwaters as well. So I can't say that it's totally out the window for distance swimming, like two to three kicks could change your entire race could drop totally. seconds off of it. So, I mean, if you're commit, if you can commit to it, I, it would, I think it could, it's easy, easy speed. So, yeah. you know, well, and, and that's, that's a great point in kind of getting back to what we said earlier. Like if you think about it, if you could just save yourself three tenths of a second off the wall, if you can get from the wall to the 15 meter mark, just three tenths of a second faster every single time, in a 200 yeah. yard freestyle, you have seven opportunities to push off the wall. That means that if you just save yourself three tenths of a second, which is basically nothing, every single time for those seven push offs, you're going to go over two seconds faster in that 200 freestyle, and you didn't even have to work any harder for it. So think about the 500 yard freestyle, the 400, 400 meter freestyle, the mile, whether it be the 1500 or the 1650. If you can just get that little bit better, off the wall, it's going to pay dividends down the road. Um, you know, we're starting to get close to an hour here, folks. So we're going to wrap it up. But I see a lot of questions, um, some of them about staying mm -hmm. fit when we're not swimming. Um, we actually have a couple of episodes that we've already posted uh, up at fitterandfaster.com slash replays, where you can go and look at our website and see some past workouts that we've done. And then we've also got Two workouts coming later this week on Thursday and Friday that you can see at fitterandfaster.com slash live and make sure you sign up for those. And um, we're going to be doing those weekly. And if you guys are super interested, we're going to be playing, uh, doing them even more often than that. So um, show us that you want more by signing up and registering for those um, right away. Guys, do you have any last um, messages you want to give everybody before we wrap up? Um. You know, I think what you can do while you're not in the pool to improve your streamlines and improve your uh, underwater kicks is work on mobility. Um, like uh, you saw in mine, I have a really nice flexible spine. So I spend a lot of time on the foam roller, just kind of like bending my spine over the foam roller. Uh, when I was a kid, I didn't have a foam roller. So I would just like bend over the side of the couch. Um, just stretching a lot, stretching the hamstrings, uh, stretching the ankles. They're little things I don't seem like a lot, but they add up to a lot of big changes, I think. Um, so yeah, I mean, stay positive, but I think that would be a great way to just, you know, get yourself a little further while you're not in the pool. Uh, just work on mobility for sure. Marina, um, if you know, I, there are a lot of questions, obviously, that are that you see are scrolling past. Yeah. Uh, if anybody wants to reach out to you directly on Instagram, um, can you spell out your Instagram handle for them so that they can reach out to you directly? Yeah. So it's Marina, M-A-R-I-N-A, -A, Kilani, K-E-A-L-A-N-I. Um, and yeah, so... I'll, if anyone ever DMs me, I usually answer their questions pretty quickly. Uh, I usually do that after camps as well when we can't finish Q&A. Um, but, yeah, I'm always happy to help. All right. Chris, what about you? What's your uh, what's your Instagram handle so people can reach out to you with any questions that they have? Yeah, it's at Christopher underscore P and then read R-E-I-D. So it's uh, C-H-R-I-S-T-O-P-H. E R and then underscore P read. And that's R E I D, right? R E I D, the English word oh. spelling. <laughs> so, all right, y'all, you guys did a great job. Um, I hope everybody liked it. Uh, by the way, there's an offer up on your screen right now for um, an app that Fitter and Faster has called Swim Videos On Demand. Another way to get better while you're at home during quarantine is to look over a lot of good video. Uh, and drills with explanations from our top clinicians. And that, that app is one way to do it. So go ahead and click that register now button and go over to our website and check out Swim Videos On Demand. Try out the free trial, see if you like it. And, um, you know, the more, again, the more we know you guys like that stuff too, the more effort that we can put into that to keep bringing you new videos and new content. Um, guys, you did great. Uh, 
I think we're going to wrap it up at this point. Everybody stay safe, stay positive, and wash your dang hands. Bye awesome. now. Thank you. See you.